皆さんようこそ。Welcome, welcome to Japan and welcome to our session. My name is、uh, Yuki Shioka. I'm a principal product manager for Creative Cloud at Adobe.、Um, I'm also an original member of、uh, InDesign Japanese, which is known for its highly culturalized text features. Now, m a c a u l i n and I, we've been working together for many years, and our goal has always been to address the needs of Japanese typography. Now, 35 years ago, when DTP revolution had disrupted an entire industry, which was a great thing, but at a cost of beautiful typography. So, here's Nat Macaulay to talk about the future of、uh, dynamic and responsive Mojikuri. Thank you.、Uh, thanks, Yuki.、Uh, thank you all for、uh, coming to this talk today. Um, I've been involved most of my career in the development of text layout software, first at Apple and then at Adobe. When we started out on InDesign more than 20 years ago, the requirements for Chinese, Japanese, and Korean text were not very well understood by the Western development community. Those requirements are obviously different from those for English and other Latin based scripts, but how they differ has been, I think, misunderstood or at least not widely agreed upon. Uh, especially if you look at the implementations and the results today. Furthermore, the phrase CJK text composition is often bandied about without thinking much about what makes each of those languages typographically、uh, unique or that each has their own history and future evolution. In Adobe's products, even, we have often made the error of conflating the requirements of Japanese and the other East Asian languages simply because we lack the resources. To delve more deeply into those essentials that make type beautiful and legible and clean. I will touch on four points. First, that the use of type in Japanese, Korean, and Chinese graphic design, although different from one another, h a v e a commonality that I feel has been overlooked in modern layout engines developed in the West. Second, that the relationship of the type to the rest of the layout is critical to get right. If one is to preserve the design intent of the artist who made it. Third, that this relationship comes from the interplay of how ideographic type evolved and the particular ways white space is used in the layout to evoke mood or place the type in context, or the other way around, the context of the whole design being informed by what is written and how that text is set. Fourth, That which has come before in terms of best practices are typically designed for static print layout. So, in a dynamic world, what is the most important thing that anchors that design intent? And how does it relate to the type? How can those anchors be preserved or extended to support automatic reflow for different screens? For a layout, for a layout engine, it must first be able to put glyphs on a line in the correct fashion. And for most part, all engines can do this well enough if the glyphs are the same point size and the font has the right width in its data. The trouble is, this is not the case for all but the most basic scenarios, partly due to a limitation in what information is in the font itself, but also because of a limitation in how the layout engine expects to modify spacing and placement of glyphs on the line and of the lines in a frame. Those limitations are there chiefly because only English was considered when they were conceived, and the other languages and scripts were forced to conform. To the English based design later on. An example of this from my experience was the lack of ideographic baseline metrics in fonts. Digital fonts and most of the software that render them use reference points corresponding to Roman typographic metrics in the internal coordinate system for the canvas on the screen. The origin point of a glyph is at the left side and the Roman baseline, even for non Roman fonts. Even when, these two, even when two fonts are the same point size, <clears throat> using any of the other Roman font metrics as reference points for text line or graphic object placement would not be reliable because those metrics differ according to the font design based on differences in the glyphs. In Western typography, the only reference point that is reliable across fonts for line placement and grids, for example, is the Roman baseline. So, what are we talking about when we say Japanese text metrics as reference points? These lines of text use the same point size, the same Roman baseline Y positions, and the same leading. Yet, as you can see, the reference points used on the right side for traditional Japanese layout are not the same as those on the left. How the computer conceives of the text location in these two examples is exactly the same. But as you can see, the frame edges don't agree, which usually means the frame Y position will not agree, 
This means the space around the frame, which is so important to specify exactly for the layout artist when creating that vital white space balance, is not easily derived from the information in the application's UI. The designer must eyeball it manually. Leaving aside the issue of line and text object placement, let's look at different requirements for glyph placement on the line. From the point of view of traditional Japanese type layout conventions, the Roman baseline is simply not a useful metric for placement of runs on the line or of lines on the canvas. Yet, this is what computers use to draw text and what fonts use for their primary reference point and zero, zero coordinate. Traditional Japanese layout uses the ideographic inbox. Using it, runs of different sizes line up nicely. How, but such information is not in all fonts and must be computed by the layout software. Open type fonts can optionally include this information in the base table introduced since the introduction of InDesign 20 years ago. Lacking that, the ascent and descent metrics have to be overridden to be roughly equal to the inbox, but then you lose the use of those metrics for Western typographic ascent and descent. I have described some important differences in how traditional Japanese type layout is done versus Western typography, and how internal workings on the machine use Western conventions necessitating stating some adjustment to achieve correct results for Japanese. Now let's examine some Japanese print designs, some historic examples of text and white space balance, and see how the traditional metrics inform how white space is expressed and measured in the layout. Yasushi Fujimoto's design of this magazine cover shows an example of how the line between text and graphic elements is blurred, where the text becomes almost structural in filling up the space. This crowdedness is a way of making a statement about what this almost st structural text actually says. Charles and uh, Ray Eames, that's what it says. Um, this crowdedness uh, makes a statement and it, uh, it gives weight and as well as a visual homage to the modernist influences that uh, the magazine is a special edition for. Um, Masami Shimizu's design here of a full spread ad shows how the spare use of text and its placement in the space is at once intentional and free. Its minimalism makes a strong statement as well. To understand how to support dynamic layouts, one must understand the specifics of text placement in Japanese graphic design and how placement relates to white space and to Japanese text metrics. The placement of text is the result of a precise calculation of the space around the edges of the text and the other elements. And in today's digital fonts and graphic design software, there is still much to be done to aid in this placement. For example, in CSS, we have much better capabilities with every new release of the browsers. But for Japanese typography and layout, there are still significant advancements on the horizon. When examining these modern designs, and in particular getting familiar with well, how white space creates this balance, one must look back through history and see how textual elements were handled before the age of movable type. For examples of beautiful use of white space in a historic context, look at this calligraphy by Korean uh, calligrapher Kim Jong-hui, in which the slender leaves of the orchid come alive in the white space, almost tickling the eye with their movement into it. Here the text is basically graphical in its role, not really separate from the other elements. White space is culturally significant in East Asian art and religion. It evokes a presence of absence, and each depends on the other for its very existence. The precise control of white space in the design is, critical, is a critical building block on, upon which Japanese and other East Asian graphic design relies. Throughout history, even prior to fonts and typesetting, graphic design incorporates the use of white space around text as an integral part of the graphic design, and this influences how it is placed on the page. This calligraphy by Kohei Akokamoto says, steep cliff. The white space makes that cliff face come alive and exemplifies the balance I'm talking about of white space and content in graphic design. Through woodblock prints and then of metal type and to digital, the fact that most of the time the glyphs are regular, square, or near square, and essentially grid-like, means that designers see the text differently than one sees text written in Roman characters. I think it is the grid-like appearance that makes your eye expect certain proportions in the white space around the text. This interplay of white space and textual content in the Japanese layout is what makes it distinct when compared to Western origin designs. 
even before movable type. The interplay of text characters, lines, and the space around them can still be seen, as in this flyer advertising a medicine from the Edo period. And today one sees modern advertising trying to evoke a similar mood and style with its use of this calligraphic font and vertical type layout, as in this T ad that proclaims its effect on aiding fat reduction in the body. Spacing and its relationship to mood are of course not unique to Japanese design. However, there are culturally significant aspects that we can see in these examples that are integral to how spacing is decided. Take for example, this article in Plus Designing Magazine about layout from some years ago. In that article, these ads for tea with their traditional layout style, which is to say wide leading, vertical layout, slight intercharacter spacing, slightly calligraphic font, and depicting med meditative scenes of moon viewing in the fall or quiet viewing of a rock garden, and then copy that talks about how the product is linked to traditions of Japan, epitomize the yin and yang of space and content to achieve the right balance and evoke the right mood. And this one, this time the use of calligraphy and a layout style evocative of poetry allows the white space to wind through the text in an or for an organic sense of balance, anchored by the Corner, uh, anchored in the corners by the company brand. The result looks organic at first, but is actually tightly controlled. Is the use of copious amounts of white space unique to Japan or even to East Asia? Of course not. However, I do see differences. This, for example, in a Starbucks in Canada. Clearly, a different sense of balance is behind the choices made here than in what we were looking at previously. The text, the layout, the space, the choice of placement, all are quite different in feel from the more integrated examples we see every day in Japan. So how do these layouts come together on the artboard of the Japanese designer? Let's take a look at a few layouts by Mr. Tsuyokatsu Kudo. Mr. Kudo has graciously allowed me to show some of his work to illustrate what I'm talking about regarding precision and how space around text is measured, all to create balance in the layout. These posters show how Japanese text is very flexible in how it can be laid out, and you can see the use of traditional Japanese metrics and baselines for placement of different fonts and type sizes. Again, the arrangement of white space is precise and intentional, and really sets off the other elements with great care and attention to the overall balance of the design, letting it breathe. This book cover design. Here is the final design proof. How did he specify the layout? How would one characterize the spacing that is essential to the design intent? How would one design the spacing to be flexible and flowable while maintaining that essential balance? Here is the design spec mock-up. The point sizes are in Q units, equal to quarters of a millimeter. All spacing is in millimeters as well, and measured from the ideographic inbox edges of the text. There are vertical and horizontal lines that also are placed precisely at the inbox edges. These lines illustrate where various runs of horizontal and vertical text should be placed relative to the other runs and always use the ideographic inbox edge as a reference point. Another example is this book cover design cropped here to show the text. Again, different point sizes of type, all aligned precisely on their ideographic inbox reference points. Here's another example where the inbox edges between characters in the vertical line are used to center the positions, again, of the inbox of the horizontal lines. Inbox center baselines are used as well. For me, this design shows how text provides a grid-like structure to the white space. The use of different fonts and point sizes and red color give interest to the eye while maintaining that slightly gravity-defying gravity unevenness of placement. Coding responsive layout designs is hard. In this website, the page has been coded to mimic the exacting specifications of a printed page. Each line is placed explicitly, and even the letter spacing of each character has been individually adjusted to achieve a tighter look called tsumegumi. This makes the page completely static, and it only supports a single form factor. And Due to a 
Western, uh, let's see. However, due to the Western specific nature of the CSS letter spacing attribute, only the trailing edges are adjusted as opposed to both edges at once, as Japanese Tsume has done. And due to a browser issue, there is some undesired clipping of the glyphs. The typical responsive web page has blocks of text with some text elements resizing and others reflowing with the white space around them adjusting according to the algorithms in the browser. While this looks pretty good for Western languages, the designer really has little control of the line placement as, long, as far as uh, aligning the different elements to the inbox edges, for example, or preserving the white space balance so that it relates at all to the reflowed text. It is my hope that future standards for CSS text can grant the designer more precise control of how to specify the space around text objects in terms of the font metrics to position objects relative to text contents, traditional inbox edges or centers, and define a new range of motion and constraints that honor the design intent for these users. In my work, I am advocating software teams undertake these next steps so that more software solutions support correct typography for East Asian languages like Japanese. My work on the Japanese Language Requirements Task Force for the W3C is related to this on the web. And of course, within Adobe, I am pushing for improvements in all our layout solutions. I would like your feedback. And here is some contact information. Anyone who is interested in this topic, I'm very interested to have this I haven't posed many answers in this talk. I've mostly asked questions. That's partly because there are not easy answers. But I'm very excited to engage with others in the community. ご清聴ありがとうございました.